Okay, it's four o'clock where I am, but it's o'clock anywhere in the world. Well, okay, on most places, in many places in the world. Um, so let's start this, uh, seeing that um, yeah, people are coming still in, but um, I think I think it's a good time to start already. Um, you can do the chat slides. <laughs> yeah, right. Get, now that now that I've uploaded them once more. Um, I also I think in particular I should really should be showing this, um, even though all of you know that this is how we work, but it's a good to have the reminder ever ever now and then. Um, agenda wise, as always in the in the notes, um, there are a few announcements on new document status, and then Karsten has questions on how to proceed precisely with EDN literals. Um, I'd go, um, yeah, and then there is an issue where I'd like to have a bit of feedback from the working group in the role as designated expert for assigning a tag, just to make sure that I'm not missing something that actually everyone is rooting for, but nobody talked about so far. Um, anything that I'm missing here or anything that you'd like to add? Um, hearing nothing, let's get started. Um, I'll pass control over to Carsten because he has slides on most of the earlier part. And I'll still do some talking because this works really better if someone who is not the author uh, talks about it. So congratulations, Carsten. Um, time tag um, is already through all 48 and the update to the CDD algorithm has been approved. So this can go to the RFC editor. Um, yeah, but, almost, almost. <laughs> That's why I made it slide. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you can still fill in the details. Um, and one very short uh, notice thing that so short notice that um, it's not even on your slides yet. Um, EREF um, got stuck in the adoption phase, but it got good uh, good comments. One, two, three, four people said that yes, they want to have that, and that's not even counting myself because chair head off. I want this too. Um, so yes, this is now a working group item. Great. Um, Carsten, I think you should already have slide control. Um, so um, yeah. So let me see whether the change slides button works for a non-chair as well. It does. Great. I haven't hadn't tried that yet. Okay, so this is almost the same list except that uh, we also have an agenda item on. Uh, EDN literals that will probably take the, the bulk of the maybe half an hour we need. Um, so just to explain the, the status of uh, time tag, um, that already was in Auth 48. And uh, we had a late uh, comment that made us change something. And our responsible AD, uh, Francesca, um, decided uh, we would need a second uh, ITF uh, last call. That has concluded uh, this morning at uh, uh, midnight Pacific Daylight Saving Time. And uh, so we are now in the status waiting for AD go ahead. And uh, Francesca essentially needs to press a button to uh, play the document back into the RFC editor queue uh, it's currently in ISG status, which means it, it's uh, uh, temporarily taken out of the uh, RSC editor queue because of this uh, change. So uh, Francesca essentially has to press the button, and I'm not aware of any work that the, the working group um, actually has to do at this point. So this will go. Um, it's a cause just waiting for um, pressing the button. Uh, the, the next one is a little bit more work. The uh, update grammar um, is in status approved announcement to be sent AD follow up. It, it recently was approved announcement to be sent revised ID. Uh, I submitted that re re revised ID um, based on the, the PRs we had uh, in, in GitHub. 
so I believe the, the current draft Dato 6 is fully updated for final approval. But again, Ori has to verify that and press the button. And all that button pressing is going to be a bit slow at the moment because uh, the ISG is at a retreat and they probably prioritize retreat things over a normal uh, procedure. So that's the, the status here. And I would like to use the, the rest of uh, the meeting, uh, hopefully not the uh, whole time, uh, on EDN literals, uh, just to uh, remind uh, you of the status. Uh, this is again in um, ISG processing in the first phase, the IETF last call and it has completed um, IETF last call and is therefore instead is waiting for AD, go ahead, revised ID needed. Um, so the, the IETF last call was based on dash 09 and we are now working on dash 10. And uh, we are almost done um, as a working group, I think. Uh, so let me just uh, quickly summarize the status. First of all, we have five pull requests that address a review comments that came in in the context of the IETF last call. Um, so th there's always uh, something that can be added to the security considerations. Um, there was a little uh, slim guidance on error handling for the, the uh, tag 999. Uh, the encoding indicators uh, uh, require the reader to have a little bit of clairvoyance. Um, so uh, th there's some text that explains things a little bit better now. And there is text about how long numbers are used in, in EDN. And finally, uh, Christian found a superfluous S, uh, an optional. <laughs> <laughs> Christian notices that to Germans tag 999 is uh, uh, very, very negative. <laughs> Ira. Ira. I, um, a question. I think this was mentioned in the last uh, interim call. Uh, is there any idea of actually improving the title of this document because it's too long-winded and too obscure, in my opinion, um, before we publish it. Um, anyway, that's my thought. That's a very good point. This is probably exactly the point where, where we should be doing this. Uh, say again, please. Sorry, I didn't understand that. This is exactly the point where? We should be doing this. Uh, I mean, doing it later in the process would be weird, uh, but uh, doing it uh, as the result of uh, ITF last call comment. I think Ira sent this to the mailing list already and it kind of didn't go into an issue, uh, I think. So we just missed that. Um, th that sounds like the pr procedurally the right thing to do. So the current uh, title is uh, CBOR Extended Diagnostic Notation EDN, Application Oriented Literals, ABNF and Media Type. And it started out as Application Oriented liter Literals and then got it got ABNF and then it got a Media Type. But by now it, it kind of rolls up everything we know about Extended Diagnostic Notation. So it's exactly the, the BIS kind draft that, that people are asking from us in other places. Um, and probably the title would, would need to say that, uh, folks, you are not no longer referencing 8949 and 8610. Uh, when you're talking about uh, diagnostic notation, you are um, you're supposed to reference this one. So perhaps a title along the lines of EDN update that says it updates the previous. Uh, that's difficult because both 8610 and um, 8949 are 
standards track, and this is an informational document. Uh, so I don't know whether we actually can formally update those other uh, documents. Um, it's... Perhaps EDN extensions. Um, and, and right, obviously we can't formally update. You're right. Cause... Might be something along the lines of comprehensive diagnostic, not uh, comprehensive something on EDN. Yeah, that yeah, seems Yeah, we, we definitely have to do some wordsmithing, but uh, uh, I think it would be good to to get a little bit of the uh, over specific specificity out of this title. Because it, it the current version makes it feel like it's only those things and nothing else has changed, but really it is more comprehensive of the end, you know, best practice. That's kind of the release 2024 of extended diagnostic notation. Um, I think that, that would actually describe it best, but that's not usually what we say in RSCs. Um, I fully expect that we will continue to extend uh, diagnostic notation in, in some forms in the future. Um, but th this is kind of the, the snapshot and it has the important things uh, in it. So it has the recent extensions and it has the, the rolled up ABNF. And it would be nice to put this in, into one term in the title. Is there a reason it's going to be informational rather than standards track, given that we certainly want people to follow this? Well, the this is not meant to be a format for interchange, except that it is uh, when it comes to, to um, examples and specifications and uh, interfaces between tools and things like that. And traditionally, we have uh, identified documents that, that really are not the ones that, that control the uh, interchange as informational. Um, we, we had some discussions about this uh, already. Um, the, the point here is that if we break something here, uh, that usually won't break SIBO uh, applications. It will make working with tools harder. Um, but we, we don't have the same extremely strict backwards compatibility requirement. Um, that we have for the actual interchange format. But this is the first time that we have ABNF, isn't it? Yes. And the, the funny thing is that the, the appendix says, I hope it says that, um, that it is normative. Yeah, That's so Appendix A says, this appendix is normative. <laughs> In an informational document. Good yeah. trick. <laughs> but that, that sounds like something someone in the IESG might complain about in reviews anyway. I, yeah, that was why I asked, because, I mean, we we don't want people to diverge from the ABNF, right? I mean, for oh, we do, we do. Um, so uh, Rohan has made a proposal for how to do a single level ABNF in, uh, except for the uh, two level ABNF that we currently provide in the document. 
and uh, I think that that's totally fine. You can put up an alternate uh, MENF that, that does the parsing in one step instead of the two steps we currently have. And that's fine. So the ABNF is, is normative in the sense that it describes what the valid instances of uh, EDN documents are, but it's informative in the sense of you don't need to use it in your application. The application can achieve the same effect in a different way. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, definitely a fine point and, and having normative parts in uh, informational uh, documents may seem to be a paradox at first, uh, but if you think about it some more, the, the, um, this essentially means th there is no normative intent uh, for the entire specification, uh, but if you actually use the specification, uh, then there are parts that, that you better stay compatible with. And those are the normative parts of the specification. Anyway, let, let's note down okay, this let's, issue let's and, yeah. and uh, make sure that we uh, uh, do this before we submit the next version. Okay, so. Um, as I said, that there are five PRs that are ready to uh, merge, um, and um, we, we don't don't yet have uh, a lot of reviews for all of them. So we have two that have a Shepard or an AD review. We have one that that has another uh, review from another uh, reviewer who is also in this meeting right now, and we have two where people didn't provide reviews yet, as far as I know. Uh, but that doesn't mean they aren't ready to, to merge. So I, I would not have a problem with going forward uh, with those, but I wouldn't mind a review either. These are short pieces of text. So that's number one. Number two is the proposal by uh, Juan Mai uh, to uh, replace the ABNF, which is uh, essentially uh, focusing on the EDN literals part of the uh, document, which provides extensibility within the ABNF uh, by having uh, a common part that is done by everybody and uh, then passing on the, the pre-parsed components to the specific extensions that are provided for, for literals. Um, and uh, he's proposing to merge that back and have a single pass ABNF. Um, and um, yeah, the, I think at least two implementers have said, actually, that's making my work harder. Uh, part, part of the reason is if you use a modern parser generator and uh, uh, generate an AST, uh, then this uh, dual pass mechanism actually makes it extremely simple to, to program. Um, and uh, there's also the problem that if you are merging the two levels, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So the result might be really weird and no longer be implementable in, in the multi-pass way that, that uh, we like. So that there is some complexity there, there's some risk uh, there. And of course, each time a new application oriented literal is being defined, uh, that doesn't, that, that wouldn't just have to um, define its second level syntax, but it would have to, to describe how this is uh, actually merged into the single pass ABNF, which also is more work uh, than one would uh, probably want to have. And finally, of course, uh, as I said, you can write your own ABNF. Your, uh, if your implementation works better with a single pass grammar, uh, there's nothing that, that should stop you from that. And we already have a work in progress uh, PR that could be developed to, to an ABF, the ABNF that actually works as a single pass ABNF. And I think we could write this up in a wiki or, or in some other uh, reference 
a place that can be referenced like a GitHub repository. Uh, so we're not actually use, losing anything by going for a, a, a layered ABNF. So that makes me a little bit skeptical we really want to do this. So if anybody has, has a different view on this, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, so the, the, the main argument that uh, can be made for single pass is that people have been doing this before. Uh, but uh, that, that's maybe one, one aspect um, that um, is rather typical for CBO that we don't necessarily just do things as they have been done before, but we, we often have innovations. I remember all the discussions we had in 2013 about introducing tags, and I think most people would agree that this was a pretty good idea. Anyway, so if there's no further comment on this, I'm going to the next slide and let's focus on the elephant that is in the room. <sighs> the arrow doesn't become active. That's weird. Um, so uh, one of the, the last things we, we changed in RFC 8610 when, when developing RFC 8610, uh, which has an appendix about extended diagnostic notation, was we wanted to have a way to concatenate uh, string literals uh, so, so they can be used to build one larger uh, string literal. And uh, at the time, uh, we thought, um, let's be as close uh, to the, the C language as possible, because people are used uh, uh, to the C language. And that actually has a concatenation mechanism that is just uh, putting in the, the components to be concatenated uh, one after the other with nothing in between. So we have implicit uh, concatenation. And that's what written up what's written up in Appendix G4 uh, of uh, RFC 8610, which is one of the two input documents of, of the document we are discussing. So th this works. Unfortunately, essentially nobody has implemented it, which which is. Uh, uh, um, I did. Go ahead. Um, I did implement that. Oh, you did. Oh, you did. Based. Based on the based on the ABNF in the current draft. Okay. But that that's a relatively recent thing. Yes, that was basically only because hey, now we have an ABNF, so I can, and I yeah. and I found the tools to do pack parser, so now I can do it easily. Okay. Of course, I implemented it in my my uh, proof of concept ABNF EDN ABNF tool as well. Um, so it's not that co uh, complex to implement it. Um, but it's it's not like we have a large user community with with uh, lots of uh, examples that make use of this. So I think we got feedback from Rowan that he's actually he actually would like to have a concatenation mechanism so he can uh, put things uh, uh, on uh, limited length lines. Uh, without having to resort to RFC 87, 92, or whatever the number of that um, RFC is that tells us how to break long lines and examples in RFCs. Um, so, yeah, I, again, I have implemented as well, but it, it hasn't been, uh, I, I, I'm not aware of anybody um, actually using this in, in specifications. Um, so the, the damage is probably limited. Now, why, why would one want to have an explicit uh, uh, concatenation operator? The reason is that um, if this is implicit, we cannot make commas optional. Um, so um, the, the commas are really needed to distinguish two strings in an array, for instance. Uh, from uh, the concatenation of uh, two strings as one element of the array. 
Um, so uh, by by making the uh, concatenation, which is rarely used, uh, explicit, we can make the commas uh, optional. And uh, this has been requested a lot uh, by uh, people. So I don't have a complete uh, PR uh, for this yet, but the actual change is, is implemented in the uh, uh, EDN ABNF tool in the branch EDN ABNF EC. And um, well, this is the change. The, the, the one at the top of the slide is the actual introduction of the concatenation uh, operator, which is, uh, as you can see, an entirely trivial change to make to the ABNF. And uh, what's on the bottom half of the slide is uh, the places where we can uh, replace a required comma with an optional space behind it uh, with an optional comma. So we had the OC uh, production before, the OC rule, and OC is an optional comma followed by uh, uh, optional space. And um, so there are four places where we now can make the comma uh, optional in the outer zero sequence, in the array, in the map, and in stream strings. Um, so strings that, that uh, make use of the special syntax for <clears throat> being uh, put together from several parts. So th this is um, different from the concatenation thing because this is about uh, 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 indefinite length uh, encoding. So you describe in the, the uh, diagnostic notation which uh, parts are being put together at the Seymour level and, and not at the uh, EDN language level, which is a different thing. Anyway, so th there are four places that, that have to change. And uh, yeah, it, it's a pretty obvious thing. So I, I did a global substitute of comma s into OC and then of course had a recursive grammar. So I had to pick out the change in the OC rule itself. Uh, but th that's about all that, that needed uh, to be done. So uh, from an implementation point of view, this is a rather inexpensive um, thing to do. So the, the upside, as I said, is that uh, we can make commas optional. And uh, Christian actually dug out an RFC that already uh, thinks that commas are optional, uh, 9529. And th there are several internet drafts that are missing out on comma, uh, in commas, uh, which is really just uh, underscoring that uh, people want optional commas because it's, it's a pain uh, to put them in. It's a bit like, like language, languages that lost their semicolons as soon as parsing technology was uh, advanced enough. The other observation is that in CDDL commas already are optional. So one, one of the big differences between EDN and CDDL would uh, uh, go away. Um, so that, that's another big uh, plus. Um, yeah, I, I said that it has been rarely used and uh, it may be may have been a somewhat surprising uh, feature and of course it's it's hidden in an appendix of, of uh, uh, CDDL of the CDDL specification which maybe didn't uh, help its adoption either um, so on the uh, downside um, this is the first time we are making an actual change here um, we have a number of, of uh, places where uh, we have defined things that were a little bit wobbly uh, in the existing specification. So uh, it's not, not the only place where uh, implementers should be reading the current spec and trying to make sure to be compatible with it. Uh, but this is uh, something that was specified to be one way and uh, will in the future mean something different. And theoretically, existing examples might change their meaning, even if that changes from uh, being wrong to being right. 
Um, and uh, what, what I don't like in a programming language or in, in other computer language, if a change is made, um, that uh, when something non-backwards compatible happens, does not lead to an error message. And that, that's exactly what's happening here. So if you write two uh, strings uh, in, in EDN in a place uh, where um, there might be multiple values, like in an array, uh, then this will now be accepted as two elements of that array, while before it was a single uh, string. So this is a bit ugly. Uh, but yeah, I think it's worth the cost. And uh, on the cosmetic side, um, I think it was specifically uh, mentioned that uh, the, the wonderful ellipsis notation, which is new in this draft, is now getting noise added to it uh, because you have to put plus signs around the ellipsis um, if you want to, to write down a string with, with an elided uh, part. Well, yeah. So we got used to the, the first way of doing things, and now we, we are stuck with the second way, but it's it's not that much that much worse, I think. At least after you have looked at it for at least five minutes. Um, then we have a red hole. <laughs> Which character do we use for continuation? My prototype uses plus uh, because that's really what most languages in this space use. Perl and PHP use dot. Uh, Lua uses a double dot. Visual Basic uses ampersand. Uh, PowerShell uses tilde. Um, SQL and and a lot of of uh, uh, the the languages that are used in, in notating crypto uh, use a double pipe. And then we have the caret in, in Pascal. Um, so we have a good choice of, of operators that uh, would be possible. But I think plus is the least surprising one. We also have precedent in that Yang uses plus in exactly the same, same semantics. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I think we don't have to, to open this up, but we can simply go ahead and decide it should be a plus. So last slide. Um, the uh, procedure would be um, to merge the five PRs that are ready to merging, ready for merging, uh, to write another PR for a new title that, that's not on the list yet. Um, to write another PR for issue 42, which doesn't have a PR yet. Um, as you have seen, the actual ABNF change is trivial, but we probably need to insert pieces of text uh, in a number of places and then submit a dash 10 as a revised uh, ID. And then it's uh, Ori's decision. Ori is the, the responsible ID for this uh, document. Uh, to either move this forward to, to an ISG ballot uh, because uh, it just uh, reflects the outcome of the, the IETF last call um, or do an extra IETF last call first because there was a change. So I don't know what Ori's uh, view of this is and we probably will not find out before next week. Um, uh, but yeah, in case B, we will lose two more weeks. That's all I had. So, um, as, as, as that space, sorry, I think I'm echoing somewhere here. But that, anyway, um, I haven't heard too many voices on that change about, um, to, to give me an impression of, um, like, Where's the working group with this, even though it's technically not the working group thing, but Ori might ask me. Um, so I do a quick, uh, start a quick show of hands for that. Yeah, let, let me just point out that most of the discussion we have had on this happened on the JSON mailing list. Uh, because there, there were people who were looking for a more humane 
version of JSON that at some point I just threw into the ring. Why don't you use Cibo diagnostic notation? It has everything you need. And <laughs> yeah, it was everything except for optional commas. So that, that's really the one thing that, that was uh, uh, standing in the way um, of uh, um, being able to recommend zero diagnostic notation for, for JSON use as well. Did you just kill the, the... Yes, because I thought I could do some more like options, but it's really just yes, no, no opinion, so... Yeah, maybe you need a, need a title that asks asks a question. Yes, that's I'm 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 struggling a bit still to to phrase that in a in a in a good in an action in a question that where I can later interpret the outcome. Right. Um, so I think I'd like to do this in a in a two stage um, two stage question. First is like for those those in the meeting who are not um, Kasten and me, um, have you followed enough of the discussion to think that to, to kind of make an informed opinion? And I'll have another round there um, to then say that whether that's whether whether you like it or not. But I, have you followed the process far enough? So the show of hands tool is the like, next to the chat in the top um, in the top bar. You probably need to ask the question whether anybody has an opinion on whether he has an opinion. That sorry, just please say again. <laughs> ask whether anybody has an opinion on whether he has uh, an opinion. And so right now, three people have an opinion on, on whether they have an opinion. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll cut this here and re and re for So just for, for context, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people in the room who could press the button. Right. That includes uh, that, that includes chairs and authors who also can have an opinion. Uh, I, I hope I hope I hope they have. Anyone still needs time because it's one one more voice. So we have four opinions. So the the, the question is a bit abbreviated, but I think the yes and no buttons should be should be your friends here.
I think that unless someone has input they want to provide here now, and can, there would have been opportunity, but I'd still wait some time. Um, I'd say the eventually, as Carsten described it, it is up to Ori um, where to take this where to take this next. And personally, I hope that um, yeah, let's go with another change is, is the outcome there. Okay, um, not hearing anything more. Um, thank you, Carsten, for for the updates here. Um, there is one question that um, I don't have. I don't really have slides for anything. Um, that is on the topic of seaboard tag allocation. Um, so um, what, an allocation that is currently on my desk for review as an expert is um, a request from DC Bore on using a tag as I'm um, on a tag that describes that what is in there is DC Bore, but how it is mostly used um, is shown in the in the notes and around line 103. Um, that is, you have an envelope structure that is an alternative between several variants, some of which are uh, map shaped, some of which are list shaped. And there is one entry there, leaf, that is effectively any. And that will at least, I mean, in, in their case, it's, it's, um, it, it's supposed to be deterministic, so it's probably there any, the it will be tagged anyway. Um, but it's a pattern that I've seen here and there um that the that some any alternative is explicitly tagged so so that you can say that yep I, re I, re I really mean the list that contains those three items as opposed to i mean that node or that assertion um so my question to the group or to those present is um are you aware of other examples where it would have been super convenient to have a more general purpose tag for this and in some chat before the um, before the meeting started, Carsten already pointed me to something in notable tags that does more of the other things, or where you might tag elided and node and assertion and wrapped. Um, I, can you remember cases where the, something like this, in a more general sense, would have been useful to you? I cannot remember cases, uh, but uh, I can imagine cases. Uh, so, for instance, when designing the syntax for the CIs, um, we um, we were trying to to get the byte count down. So, the the uh, whether something is an array or not uh, uh, plays a role, and um, I could imagine that we would have come up with an alternative uh, design um, that uh, makes use of, of such a tag if there is a compact uh, version of that. So in particular, if there is a one plus zero uh, version of that. But I think generally the, the pattern of, of having a, a structure um, that is to be interpreted in a certain way and then embedding something else in there and essentially needing to have an escape uh, from from the the top level structure into what is embedded into that uh, that's a quite likely pattern to have and i think most uh, applications that need something like this actually use embedded CBO. So they, they put in a byte string and uh, uh, identify this as, as uh, something that, that is to be interpreted in a different way. Um, but uh, that, that is essentially happening at the encoding level. And maybe it would be good to have something similar at the data model level. So I like the idea. Uh, I don't think it solves the problem in, in DC ball where it has, has some, some additional semantics as well. Uh, but I think we should uh, keep that on, on the uh, stove uh, and, and see whether we can turn this into something useful.
Thank you. Um, the way I will likely act on this, is, um, from from what you've said and from not ha hearing much enthusiasm otherwise, is that yep, kind of we, as you say, um, keep it on the stars. But um, as for DC ball, they will likely not want to wait for it. Plus, um, plus there is some extra semantics, so um, I'll accept the two one uh, two one request, and we and we'll we'll keep we'll keep cooking this. Any more comments on this item? Um, hearing none, um, let's go into the AOB. Um, we'll meet in um, we'll meet in Vancouver. Um, we don't have an agenda yet, and we haven't really started out a call for an agenda. Um, so, given that we have a meeting scheduled for in two weeks uh, from now, um, everyone, please um, think about what you would like to have uh, discussed there and already put it into the minutes of the next interim because that is where we will do the final um where, where we will be working out what what is what is actually to be on the agenda which by the way reminds me that um i'm not sure 100 percent that i can make it to the next uh, interim meeting but very conveniently given that you are here uh, will you be around there Finding mute Finding button. Mute. Yes. Hello. Okay, great. So then it's um, whether whether I will be there will might be might depend on the weather, and I don't have to um, hope for bad weather or come or, or return early. Thank you. <laughs> no, I hope if you're going to be at the beach or something that you have good weather. So mountains actually, but yes, good weather will be great there. Mountains are better than beaches, I think. All right. Okay. Um, any other business? Yeah, those of the people who actually are working on Core SID, which is at least a CBA related activity, we will meet in another Meet Echo Room now. Thanks for the pointer. Um, with that, that, that having been announced, um, thank you everyone for your input, and see you in see you in two weeks and or in Vancouver, at least remotely in my case. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.